Hello. Uh, my name is Tomasz Gongor. This is Paweł Torbus. I'm system administrator at Interior. Uh, Paweł is system architect. We will be here to talk about uh, log analysis, how you could use quite popular uh, ELK stack to analyze logs, how this could help you debug and uh, explore unknown stages of, in your application. Okay, uh, how are you? Uh, mm. We will be talk talking about log uh, elk stack. This is uh, mostly in three basic components. It's log stash, which is a log preprocessor. Elastic search uh, is used for uh, storage, uh, indexing, and searching this data. And Kibana, Kibana is just simple front end for uh, elastic search. Oh. Okay, uh, Elk Stack uh, family is quite big. We have uh, multiple uh, software which can uh, use to manage uh, this stack. We have uh, some kind uh, shield. We can protect access for uh, Elasticsearch. We have Watcher. Watcher is uh, software to um, maintain some uh, alerts from uh, Elasticsearch. You have some data logs and you can uh, trigger some uh, alerts based on, the, on these logs. Uh, okay, we have FileBit. FileBit is uh, tool to forward the logs to logs to Logstash. Uh, before FileBit, we used Logstash forwarder. Mm, okay. Mm, what is Logstash? Uh, Logstash is uh, software mostly write in Ruby. Uh, it's uh, running under JRuby in Java environment. Uh, Logstash can receive log in multiple formats. Uh, currently, this uh, 39 uh, formats. It's parsing them to the JSON, and this JSON is stored to Elasticsearch. Uh, we can uh, use multiple plugins uh, with this Logstash. We can uh, automatic re resolve uh, geolocalization, IP address, user agents, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, like I said before, Logstash uh, receives data from multiple sources. Uh, it accepts syslog uh, logs, uh, JSON, and XML data. Uh, currently, we have uh, in Interior six uh, Logstash nodes in one single cluster. Uh, gathering these logs is from uh, 100 hosts. It's quite quite big. Okay, uh, now that's mine. Uh, during deployment of Logstash, we faced some problems. Uh, we want to share that problems with you so you could be aware of them and maybe if you start playing with it, uh, you will know that and it will be easier for you to uh, get more value at the beginning from this software. Uh, quite a big problem for Logstash are multi-line logs like uh, XML logs, like uh, Java stack traces. Uh, that's problem because uh, Logstash internally have three QEs. It's uh, input QE, filter QE, and output QE. And you could use multi-threading for filtering if you have many filters. But if you have multi-line uh, logs, uh, Logstash wouldn't know which line is uh, in which order. So uh, it can only run in one thread. So it won't scale uh, horizontally. So we have to add multiple Logstash instances for that uh, to scale. And this is uh, why multi-lines are problematic. There's also different gotchas uh, in it. For example, you have to parse uh, date from uh, events. Because if you don't parse that date, uh, for example, from access logs, uh, Elasticsearch will automatically add a date of event from uh, current time. And this will be time of log parsing, not exactly when that thing happened. So for example, if you want to correlate logs from different applications, you might have uh, some differences in times between logs from one application and second application. So this is why we always use uh, date to 
uh, extract this data and have it as a native field. Uh, another gotcha is that, for example, if you use uh, XML as a log format or JSON, it's quite easy to overwrite your uh, other variables. Uh, there is such special variable in Logstash, it's called message, and this is where original message uh, from input is passed. But if you have in your XML uh, field message, it will replace it. So this is why we have target here. So we are extracting every variable from XML document to the uh, RI Java XML, and then we could have another variable message. So those are those three. There are more. Uh, we started in Interior playing with Logstash and Syslog. It was quite natural for us. We have Syslog ng on every server. We want to use it, we don't want to put another application that could uh, overload our servers. So we started with Syslog, but Syslog by default uses UDP to ship logs to Logstash. And UDP is not reliable. Uh, we could lose some logs, especially during higher peaks like high traffic. And we don't know what exactly we lose. Mostly such things happen when you have uh, some failure or uh, higher traffic and you want to know what happened. But if you lose your logs, you wouldn't know. And then we started exploring uh, different software. And there's something like Logstash Forwarder. It's a small application written in Golang. Uh, it's quite lightweight. It's uh, just shipping log files. It has some wildcards. It's quite easy to uh, configure it to automatically detect new log files uh, created. So just when new log file will arrive, it will automatically start shipping it to the log stash. Uh, what's more, it compress uh, that stream of logs, it encrypts it, and it will wait in any case if you have problem with log stash. So it's much more reliable. We don't lose any logs with log stash forwarder. Now there is uh, another tool, it's called FileBit. And the biggest change from Logstar Forwarder is that you could use, uh, you could make multi-line parsing on uh, on the server. It would be like in uh, Logstar Forwarder. So for Logstar, it's quite comfortable because it will receive one huge multi-line event, and it could run in multi-threaded mode. It is easier to scale it. Uh, one gotcha we have uh, with Logstash Forward is uh, configuration of dead time. It's uh, here. Uh, by default, Logstash Forward didn't close uh, correctly file handles. So after a week of working, uh, free space on disk on our servers just shrink. We were thinking, what's going on? We checked what are open file handles, and we see a lot of deleted logs, but handles were still in logs that we have to restart it. So this option will automatically close log files after they didn't change for 10 minutes. So it's quite easy, but not configured by default. Uh, Another thing is memory. Uh, Logstash by default starts with about one gigabyte of memory uh, for uh, Java chip stack, and it's in mostly cases enough for it to run. But when we added more and more filters, uh, we have to extend it. And without uh, proper configuration, it was just behaving uh, strange. For example, Logstash could uh, close some plugins and didn't send logs to the output, or it could just accidentally crash and didn't restart. So uh, we have to add enough memory and had, uh, have enough uh, in-system memory to process more data. Uh, there is another small uh, thing that we have to remember when we use Grok to parse events. Grok is uh, some shortcut for uh, easier regex matching. We could prepare uh, regex matching, for example, to match IP address, 
And we could use just uh, percent and that message bracket to uh, to catch uh, IP address from logs. And then we have uh, variable name uh, where it will be stored. But problem is with uh, values that are different than strings. For example, when we have size or status or uh, on all the numeric variables, uh, because they are parsed as string, and you can't do some statistics on strings like uh, searching for minimum value, maximum value, average, etc. Uh, so you have to literally parse it and force int in logstash. Then you have a proper format uh, of the data in Elasticsearch, and uh, you could make some statistics on the data. Uh, okay, uh, after Logstash, there is uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is, uh, I don't know, for me it's a simple search engine. Uh, it's uh, based on Lucene uh, library from Java, uh, Apache. It's uh, very scalability, durability. It's, uh, you have uh, multiple nodes of Elasticsearch and you, have, you are sure that no data were lost when some nodes is gone. Uh, Elasticsearch store objects in uh, JSON. You have uh, access to these uh, objects uh, from simple uh, HTTP-based client IP, uh, and this data is uh, grouped by the indexes. Uh, Logstash store index uh, one index per day. Okay, now we have uh, multiple Elasticsearch cluster. It each cluster has uh, twenty and twenty hundred and fifteen gigabytes for each. Uh, some clusters are small, some are big. Our biggest cluster have six uh, nodes and uh, 200 gigabytes of each data. We have multiple uh, logs in this uh, Elasticsearch from multiple environments, uh, staging, production, uh, integration. Okay. Uh, also with Elasticsearch, we have a few things we have learned during deployment process and when we are testing it. And first uh, thing was how to set properly a number of shards and a number of replicas. Uh, sharding in Elasticsearch will allow you to run queries across your wall cluster. So uh, your single query will be searching for data, for example, on six nodes uh, of Elasticsearch by part on every on it. But if you mm, shard cluster in a bad manner, you could have some performance issues or uh, even cluster could be uh, overloaded. For example, this is uh, how such cluster looks. We have a single index on all the nodes, but these two nodes have one more shard. So this cluster have too much shards. It should have two additional nodes, like this one, smaller. Uh, such thing could happen naturally. For example, when you restart Elasticsearch cluster, when you do some maintenance on, on nodes, and it's okay if it's temporary, but it shouldn't run longer in such state. Uh, another thing is that most of the time, people think that having 18% uh, of usage of disks is quite okay for service. It's not case with uh, Elasticsearch. Um, you need more free space. For example, if you restart Elasticsearch and you have it in a consistent state when you have uh, uh, equal number of shards on every node, it will start migrating shards from the um, node that is not available to the um, nodes that are current in the cluster. So you have to have pl uh, place for it. Uh, what's obvious, if you have bigger nodes, it will take much longer to synchronize. This is why we have more nodes with maximum uh, 250 gigabytes. Bigger nodes were just synchronizing so long that uh, we need, for example, more than one day to synchronize data. It, it was quite huge. Mm. We also played at the beginning with uh, Elasticsearch functionality, which is auto-discovery of cluster. So every time you start new Elasticsearch uh, node, 
with cluster name, in our case, Kibana, uh, this node will automatically join Kibana cluster. It sounds really nice and it was working, mostly, but uh, we had some problems with switches. They were cutting off broadcast packets from Elasticsearch and from time to time we lost one or two Elastic nodes uh, from the cluster. It was quite painful. For now we used unicast uh, configuration. We just explicitly uh, write addresses of every node and this is working much uh, better. Uh, there is one, one gotcha that we have during nodes updating. Uh, I was talking about this earlier. When you restart single node, uh, Elasticsearch cluster will start migrating shards from this node to the rest of nodes. If you want to update servers one by one, this could take really, really long time because they will be synchronizing even all the data through the cluster. So for that, you have to disable shard allocation. There is small logpad in COPF plugin in Elasticsearch. You could just click it and it won't migrate uh, data during restart. After restart, it will check what indexes didn't change and we'll use them to synchronize faster. Mm. Like with Logstash, it's also even more important to configure properly memory for Elasticsearch. Uh, we started with giving Elasticsearch a lot of memory, too much, uh, I would say. Uh, because Elasticsearch depends also on system caches, and uh, it's just it's just good to have some memory for them. From the documentation of Elasticsearch, they recommend having maximum of 50% of system memory just for uh, Elasticsearch JVM, and not more than 32 gigabytes. Uh, because when you uh, configure more than 32 gigabytes, JVM will start using 8-bit uh, pointers. Uh, and it will be slower and will use even more memory. So it's better to have, for example, two or four virtual machines on big servers that have only 32 gigabytes uh, for Elasticsearch, let's say 32 gigabytes for the uh, system caches, and have four such virtual machines than single big uh, machine. Uh, there is also such option that is not set by default. Maybe in, in the latest version it, it was changed. I, I'm not sure right now. Uh, but you have to uh, configure it to true just to keep Elasticsearch in memory. It won't uh, be swapped. You don't want your search engine to be uh, in swap because it will just uh, run much, much slower. There is also some uh, internal cache in Elasticsearch. It's, it uses uh, Java chip space, and it's not uh, temporary. It will just collect some data during queries and use it in later queries. It's still data cache, and by default, it's uh, not configured how big it is. So it will use wall memory in Elasticsearch if you leave it in, in such uh, configuration. For us, uh, we have best performance of about 30 to 40 percent of this field data cache, and leaving rest of RAM, for example, for operation like uh, sorting, aggregation of queries, etc. Okay, we have uh, all these logs. Uh, everything is uh, working quite well. And the uh, next step is uh, how to see them. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, software called Kibana. Kibana is the, just uh, uh, interface for Elasticsearch. Is, mm, there is multiple versions of Kibana. Uh, we have Kibana Free, which is written in uh, pure JavaScript and uh, HTML. And we have uh, Kibana 4, which is written in uh, Node.js. Uh, and this is how it looks. Uh, we could talk even another hour or two about uh, how we created our cluster, about what our possibilities, but we think that more interesting will be for you what you could uh, do with having that stack configured in your uh, application. Uh, when we started, we started from simple graphs like this. This is uh, just a monitor of some process delivery. We could see how 
events arrive and for example if they have some problems uh, with timeouts uh, this graph is more sh sharp and this was this is quite basic how kibana 3 look like uh, kibana 4 is uh, white and you will see on later uh, you could use some filtering on fields here to show only fields you're interested and and uh, after we start to do such si simple graphs, we played more with different approaches, how we could uh, visualize some uh, operations, some uh, things. This is simple uh, hit me statistic from Varnish Cache. So we want to know if page is uh, cached well. And we could just extract this data from logs, create a graph, and you see that uh, it's not well cached. Uh, then we played even more, for example, what exact issues uh, are uh, requested more often. Issues, uh, I mean, uh, magazines, this is, most of these uh, graphs are from quite big uh, application serving m magazines for uh, iPads, uh, Android device, etc. And there are some errors because those are mobile devices that they sometimes run or uh, poor uh, 3G network. And we have to know if, if this is a problem in application or if this is a problem with uh, just connection. Uh, so we have some statistic what files are requested and uh, how they go. Uh, then we have uh, different uh, graphs, even more. Uh, those are from backend servers. Uh, it's quite easy to see that you have quite um, flat uh, traffic during normal time periods. But at the graph where we see status codes of service, we could see, for example, that after deployment, there were some problems and uh, it's something you wouldn't see looking in logs. Uh, there are too much logs. Uh, in this class, we have eight servers on web fronts. It's hard to log into every server and check if uh, it has some errors or not. Uh, this graph is uh, from our Interia portal. We have uh, many sites uh, logging to um, our Kibana cluster, and uh, you could see here um, errors with uh, 500 uh, and more. And from this graph, we could easily uh, nail which service have problem. We have some checks that generally check uh, uh, all web fronts if we have some errors, but it's quite hard to detect which exact sites uh, have it. Here we have uh, a list of web servers. So for example, this could be a problem with web server. It could have not enough memory or it could be swapping. Uh, or this could be a problem with single domain service. For example, they release new code and there is some bug that on specific situation could cause such error more and more. Uh, all those uh, color uh, blocks are clickable. So you could just narrow your search by clicking interesting uh, uh, block. Here we have also request which uh, cause the problem. Uh, this is more complicated graph of Varnish access meet and his uh, statistics. Uh, here we have uh, statistics from uh, different API calls. So for example, you have REST application and it have multiple functions. We have here those functions listed and we could see how they go. Uh, below we have a uh, similar graph. For every function we could see uh, how well this function is performing. Uh, for example, after update, after you change some code, it's easy because it's uh, visualized. You can't read such data just looking into the logs, but it's quite easy looking at it in Kibana. Uh, it's quite easy also to detect some uh, failure patterns like uh, here because we could just visualize them as different color and you could see that there is some persistent problem arriving on the server. You could nail it uh, just searching for exact data during that time period and that problem. 
Mm, we also have uh, integration with uh, Apple iTunes, and problem we face from time to time were uh, low, quite long response times uh, during uh, when we sell magazines from mobile application. Sometimes it passed, sometimes it won't. And this was quite problematic because this is exactly the part of application that earned money for us and we didn't know why. So we started monitoring uh, traffic to the uh, Apple iTunes uh, by uh, sniffing traffic on proxy. And we could see that uh, from time to time Apple is really having problems requesting, uh, responding our queries even more than a few seconds, so this is unacceptable. And we could then uh, escalate it to try to resolve this uh, issue. Uh, this is Kibana 4, it's newer version of Kibana. It's looking a, li a little different. It have, uh, for now, some options limited to the uh, Kibana 3. We still like to use Kibana 3. It's uh, most of the time faster, and as I said, it has more built-in options. Uh, here we have just monitoring of our uh, Logstash cluster. We started monitoring uh, some problems with uh, Logstar sending data. For example, we could see that not all Logstar nodes are equally overloaded with logs. It's quite visible here. You can't just get this data looking on server, for example, for CPU time or something like that. We have also different uh, graph to check if Logstar is if Logstar parse uh, events properly. Uh, this is especially helpful during developing Grok rules when you could see that you have some uh, strings that were not catched properly by our Grok uh, templates. And it's quite easy to detect what exactly was the, the message of a problematic uh, query and resolve it, fix your configuration in Logstash. A uh, few days ago, uh, we faced such problems with uh, amount of data generated in our Elasticsearch cluster. We have such a graph where we could see how many logs uh, were put into our Elasticsearch cluster, what are types of these logs, and from what servers those messages were generated, produced, and sent. And in our case, we normally have about 15 gigabytes uh, of logs during a normal day. But when we have problem, it happened that we have, for example, 96 uh, gigabytes of logs. It's much, much more. So we just used uh, that graph and checked where is the problem. We could see spikes, uh, quite big one. Normally, we have for about uh, 300,000 uh, events per 10 minutes, but every this spike is more than uh, 10 million. Biggest one have more than 30 millions of events per 10 minutes, so it's quite a lot. And what produced this was quite easy to nail. Uh, there is such block that was not visible on earlier uh, on in smaller time periods, so we checked what's the problem, and all events in that block were generated just by one testing server. Developers were changing something and there was running different version of application, not aware of changes in files on the server, and it was generating Java stack trace for every problem. Problem was quite banal. It was searching for files that were not in a place but it was running this in a loop and generating uh, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, it was quite easy to nail what was the problematic server generating uh, unknown traffic. And I just can't imagine how I could do this easier, for example, running grab on servers. It's happened just for about 10 minutes during the night and it was not uh, catchable during the day. So uh, this was really helpful to have this data in uh, Elasticsearch. Um, another time we were changing uh, 
indexing uh, mechanism in application, we didn't know how much it will impact performance of application. So this is another graph where we could see that when we start reindexing data, application just was responding slower. We know how much slower and we could know if we could stand this and uh, if we could continue uh, reindexing data, should we broke it and, uh, and uh, just run later. Uh, this is also data that could be hardly uh, visible in any system uh, just using standard tools. But again, Kibana is helpful. You could visualize it and you could see some trends on a graph. Uh, this is another example. Uh, I was playing with such flame type of graph uh, on varnish access logs and totally accidentally uh, we saw that we have strange hole on our graph. We didn't know what it, it is, but uh, from the graph uh, we know that for an hour a day we have uh, queries, re response time for queries longer than a uh, few seconds. Uh, and it was quite problematic what happened. We didn't know if this happened only once. So we extended the search in Kibana. And now we know that it didn't happen on. It happened every day during 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's also something not possible to catch watching to the logs. Uh, there is even a bigger hole. Uh, we were talking with programmers about that issue, and it was just uh, some type of cron task run uh, in Tomcat server every day during a day. It shouldn't be during the day, it should be during the night, but someone just made typo and it was not exactly that. So uh, this one was problem that this thread even could uh, from time to time hang, and we just keep for the whole day running on one CPU eating time. So without Kibana, probably we wouldn't know that we have that problem. Uh, this is a typical uh, working dashboard. Uh, it doesn't look nice. You probably can see what's there. But uh, to explain, uh, when you're searching for some problems on servers, you many times just grab unlock uh, files you run grab on those what you on those data you receive from one grab and you run in multiple times you could do this only on one server at a time it's hard to do uh, things on the whole cluster you don't want to overload your servers but you could do this exactly in kibana you could just search for some data you could exclude another bunch of data and uh, find exactly the problem you are searching for how often it, uh, it's showing in your application. You could get information from what servers uh, those errors are generated. Uh, that's all. Uh, I hope you enjoy our presentation. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you want to ask any questions, you could ask, even in Polish. <laughs> Ja mam takie pytanie, bo jak opowiadaliście o tych problemach z, nie wiem, z parsowaniem tych wielolinijkowych fragmentów logów, to jest takie trochę wydaje się dziwne, że z takim problemem jakby musieliście się parać samemu, a nie jest to coś, co jakby te rozwiązanie jakoś już oferuje, bo to się wydaje jakiś taki czymś takim to, totalnie, totalnie typowym, prawda? To nie jest tak, że my się z tym problemem jakoś paraliśmy, mm -hmm. to jest opisane. Natomiast e, to jest ciekawy problem, który pokazuje na przykład, że zamiast e, generować standardowe, wieloliniowe logi, które mogą być ciężkie do sparsowania, e, dużo lepiej jest wykorzystać pewne formaty, które bardzo fajnie i bardzo wydajnie się parsują. Na przykład JSONa. Jednolinijkowy JSON z wszystkimi polami, które nas interesują. Bardzo łatwo wczytuje się do Logstasha i możemy parsować gigantyczną ilość. W przypadku tego xml który tam na przykład był, e, Logstarz nie korzysta z żadnej konkretnej biblioteki do parsowania xml tylko jest tam taka biblioteka bodajże Simple XML, która robi coś w rodzaju regerspów na xml żeby to parsować. To też nie jest zbyt y, wydajne 
I niestety te logi wielolinijkowe pojawiają się. Są pewne problemy, jak je parsować. Najfajniejszy to jest właśnie ten file bit, który pozwala robić to po stronie serwera. Te po stronie log... klienta bardziej. Tak, po stronie klienta. Te logi trafiają od razu jako pojedyncze eventy i dalej możemy zachować tą wielowątkowość. Natomiast troszkę nas zaskoczyło to, że w zależności od tego, jaki jest typ logów, inaczej log staż się skaluje, inaczej się zachowuje. Więc postanowiliśmy, że, że jest to po prostu coś wartego odnotowania. Okej, okay, dzięki. Czy używacie jakiegoś systemu do alertowania właśnie takich wydarzeń, które tak, się dzieją? I, i ten, bo widzę, że macie bardzo dużo wykresów i metryk, więc pewnie ciężko podefiniować. Dużo, dużo w utrzymaniu, znaczy dużo utrzymywać trzeba pewnie takich tych statystyk. Znaczy generalnie, jeżeli chodzi o powiadamienie, to w Logstashu jest coś takiego jak notification i w locie, kiedy on otrzymuje określony pattern, on może na przykład wysłać maila albo zrobić dowolne powiadomienie. Przykładowo mieliśmy powiadomienia zrobione dla nasi deweloperzy, żeby wyjść na świat, używają proxy. I to proxy ma swoją własną access listę. Jeżeli jakiś deweloper próbuje pobrać coś z internetu i w logu zostanie odnotowane, że próbuje coś pobrać, co jest niedozwolone, to automatycznie Logstash generuje nam maila. No nie? Do tego możesz jeszcze użyć takiego narzędzia, co się nazywa Watcher. I za pomocą Watchera możesz już konkretne query robić na Elasticsearchu. I jeżeli coś się pojawi, to wtedy dostajesz też powiadomienie. Akurat my. Nie chcieliśmy z Watchera korzystać z tego względu, że on periodycznie odpytuje Elasticsearcha, czyli generuje jakieś obciążenie na klastrze, a z kolei robienie tego w locie na Logstashu pozwala nam najszybciej wyłapać poszczególne eventy i nas powiadomić, a jest też dodatkowy plugin Throttle, który pozwali, pozwala limitować ilość wysyłanych wiadomości per zakres czasu, więc nie dostajemy maila za każdym razem, za każdym requestem, jak aplikacja próbuje się dobić, tylko powiedzmy jednego na przykład na 5 minut. W ten sposób dowiadujemy się o problemie, a możliwie szybko. No i nie nadwyrężamy systemów pocztowych. A jeżeli chodzi o logi, to nie wiem, z ilu, ilu dni trzymamy? Przeważnie około dwóch tygodni, przy czym... Dwa tygodnie to jest taki aktywne indeksy, które mamy w Elasticsearchu, z których możemy w każdej chwili korzystać, ale też tworzymy snapshoty z logów i możemy błyskawicznie wrzucić do klastra w razie potrzeby przeglądania dalszych danych. Chyba tam maksymalnie mamy tak do trzech miesięcy, bo jednak Logstar, że głównie cały ten stos z Elasticsearchem służy nam do takiej analizy raczej ad hoc na bieżąco przy dewelopmencie aplikacji, do analizy takiej głębokiej logów mamy inny klaster oparty na Hadoopie i tam można już więcej rzeczy wyciągać z bardzo długich zakresów czasu. Jeżeli chodzi jeszcze o multiline, to tylko dodam od siebie, że nie wiem od początku prezentacji, ja do kolektowania logów na przykład używałem FluentD i tam można w Rabim sobie dopisywać właśnie takie filtry, które od razu tam sobie przeparsują i wysyłają do Elasticsearcha. Tak, tak. No generalnie Filebit ma opcję już na kliencie, że sobie możesz te multiline złożyć w jedną linię, no nie? I wtedy ta jedna linia trafia do Logstasha. Jeszcze jakieś pytania? Chciałem zapytać, bo ja się zborykam z takim problemem od czasu do czasu, że opsów, którzy są Linux geekami i całe życie grepowali logi na konsoli i nawet potrafią to sobie tak oskryptować, żeby tego grepa uruchamiać rozproszonego na wielu serwerach i później merżować wyniki. Ciężko przekonać do tego, żeby jednak się przesiedli na webowy interfejs i klikali w przeglądarce, żeby analizować logi. Czy spotkaliście się z takim problemem? No, my, my, my byliśmy takimi geekami, <śmiech> więc... <śmiech> to jest... więc... To jest kwestia, że trzeba zacząć z tego korzystać i zobaczyć właśnie zalety tego systemu. Wszystko można znaleźć, grypując po logach, można przygotować odpowiednie wykresy i tak dalej. Tylko, że przy pewnych takich złożonych sytuacjach, właśnie miałem nadzieję, że udało się to pokazać na tych grafikach, które pokazywałem, są rzeczy, które bardzo trudno zobaczyć na samych cyfrach. Ja widzę, że response time to jest pół sekundy, ale co to oznacza? Tego nie widać, ale jak się zobaczy, jak to wygląda w skali wszystkich requestów, to to można zobaczyć dopiero na wykresie i z tego można wyciągnąć jakiś wniosek i tego niestety te narzędzia konsolowe nie dają. Wystarczy. Też wolę z nich korzystać, ale... Wystarczy generalnie, że powiesz, że muszę się mniej napracować i na pewno to łykną, więc... 
Tak, to przeważnie działa. Tak. Dzięki. Jeszcze jakieś pytania? Dziękujemy. Dziękujemy.